The Garden of Ink and Bones is a monthly podcast about witchcraft, powerful plants, and making magic. I'm Belle of Belladonna and Bones, and I'll be joined by occult artist Rue of Old Omen, and we're witches who like to get our hands dirty. To us, magic is practical, visceral, and bound in blood to the soil and bones of our spiritual allies. It's time to get your hands into the dirt, do the work, make magic, and feel the witchcraft in your bones. Welcome to the Garden of Ink and Bones. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Garden of Ink and Bones. This is Season 2, Episode 4, and I'm with Rue. How are you, Rue? I'm going great. How about yourself? I'm good. Look, today we're going to talk about, um, back to our regular format, and we're going to talk about Plants of the Devil by Corinne Boyer from Three Hands Press, and we're going to talk about one of my favourite herbs, henbane. Yes, it's all very exciting. This was one of those books that we were having a discussion the other day and I was a bit surprised with myself that I didn't already have it and I haven't gone through any of Corinne Boyer's works before. She's also done Under the Witching Tree and she's got Under the Bramble Arch coming out soon. But this is the most amazing, most beautifully and poetically written little herbarium, I totally think, to do with poisonous plants. Yeah, and I think that, like you call it a herbarium and um, and it, it really is at its, heart, at its heart because it talks about the plants, their traditional uses, their um, medicinal, medicinal uses, their um, and how the plants were used um, in different types of magic and, and things. But it's not a here's the plant name, here's its astrological correspondences, here's its gender, here's its this. It's a story told very, very beautifully. Yeah, and the amount of, like, research that she's done into this book is absolutely phenom- phenomenal. The amount of old texts that she must have gone through for years of doing her research to find the amount of information she's put to each and every one of them. And I think it also, as we were discussing, it ties into one of our previous episodes where we said that, you know, you go through certain books and you get to the poisonous plant section and there's often a big blaring stay away sort of thing, but it doesn't really go into the rest of it. And this book, I think, treats these plants with the respect that they do need and deserve in a really, really beautiful way. And there's a sentence that sums it up, I think, absolutely perfectly which she writes, within every forest, field or mountainous landscape, within every untamed hedge, plants and trees provide adversity in materials, foods, medicine and magical powers to the hands and the hearts that are seeking them, which I think is completely true for these poisonous plants. I think they often get overlooked at their especially medicinal and sort of double binding properties that they have. You know, they can harm but they can help. Yeah, and I think that's it. It's approach with caution and um, and education but don't... Um, don't be afraid to reach out and make a, have a relationship with these plants. Mm, that's it. I think if you stay away from them completely, you might be missing some really powerful and amazing relationships that you can bond with the spirits that are entwined in them. Yeah, and I think um, you mentioned how well um, researched it was. It's also exceptionally well referenced. So you can really um, deep dive into the references as well, um, which gives you that, um, backup knowledge and perhaps even a broader understanding. Yeah. So, with this book, what would you, what would you recommend is the reason, or why would you suggest everybody really go out and get a copy of this? It's from Three Hands Press. <laughs> <laughs> There's very few books from Three Hands Press I don't recommend. Um, just because they they do seem to understand. And, yes, some of it's a little bit devil wicker, I guess, but at the same time we have to understand that they're British Isles based and the impact of Christianity in the British Isles um, upon the the local spirits and the way it was incorporated, incorporated into the extant magical practices um, it's understandable how we end up with plants of the devil and the devil's dozen and and books like that where they they choose to work with the devil because it's just a not just but it is a part of the extension of what they were working with before Christianity came to the to the island. Yeah, and I think that's sort of a 
Interesting and important note, though, because everything that contradicted Catholicism when it came about, all like every other religion, every other spiritualism, all got classed and summed up together as being part of the devil. And I think that's something to keep in mind that a lot of people, you know, hear that term and shy away. But I think if you really look into things, that maybe they're not quite how they're made out to be, that maybe this sort of stigma should be removed somewhat. Yeah. And I think I think if I said why people need this is because it is probably the most concise um it's a tiny volume. It's what 150 pages or something, 158 pages including the index. And it is a concise um herbary herbarium, whatever word. Um of the baneful plants, and I think you, if you want to start somewhere with these plants, this great, this book is a great book to start with. Completely, it's so easy to chew through, but it's one of those ones that I feel like I'm going to have to read about five times through. Even then, you could sit and read it in one sitting, just because of how beautifully, poetically she's written it, and how much information she's put into only a few pages. You'd just be constantly taking notes and taking references, but it's so beautifully adapted. Yeah, that's that's um that's true. It's interesting. Um, I was just reading the the page on Willow, and um, you don't really as- I don't really associate Willow with curse magic, um, because I think of it as a as aspirin. You know, it's it's white Willow. The it's a healer. Um, but I really like this. It's uh, to kill an enemy from a distance. One could tie knots in a willow tree. Um, and another cursing rite comes from the Romany tradition involving involved watering a branch of cut weeping willow for nine days and then pouring this water in front of the victim's home. And I quite like that because I can see the whole um, pouring it over the weeping willow branch, which gives you that sort of sadness and woe, um, and then pouring it out in front of the victim's home. Now, willow water like if you rot willow in water it's actually can be a um a root hormone it gives off a rooting hormone um so you can use it to water in plants that you want to grow but in this way you could be it could be taking root for the curse to take root in the person's home which i find interesting Mm. Yeah, she's got a few plants that like you said you wouldn't ever consider them so no she's also got the fern and blackberry and a few other ones that seem pretty mundane but then when you go into it and it's something that we were discussing before that especially ferns I had found over the years references in the past to ferns being tied to the devil even though in this really it's not a plant that you would associate with that and yet there's information to suggest that it is so there's it's a good way of even looking at ones that aren't it's not just the poisonous ones that will accidentally kill you if you use them incorrectly. There's a lot of other plants tied in there and interesting ways to use them. Yeah, and that's right. Um, what's the bit on fern that I wanted to talk about? Um, yeah, so in some parts of England, a white cloth or pewter dish or the Bible was laid under the fern for collecting so cert- purposes it was dangerous to use one's bare hands to touch it a forked hazel stick was used instead um interestingly a belief from serbia tells that if one carried the fern seed they would be pursued by serpents until it was thrown away it's like just i love the traditions around collecting plants um and how they're carried and things like that. And this book has a lot of um, information around that time. Yeah, I think it's something that sort of often gets sort of lost in history because when you do go through a lot of the older texts, they generally, everything is done in a very specific way with sort of superstition and care put around each and every single process. And I think sometimes we sort of forget about that and lose that in modern texts. Yeah, and it's it's very easy to just distill things down. I know I've been um, trying to record um, a series of videos based on how I think of um, modern magic, and it's it's really 
I'm finding it quite tricky to not lose the magic in the analysis that I've done to come to. I'm worried it comes off a bit dry, (laughs) (laughs) truthfully. Um, And I think, you know, I'm worried that I'm not conveying the magic of these plants um, satisfactorily because I'm so interested in conveying how I got to that magical purpose from um, the medicinal actions of the plant. Um, But this book does that very well. Yeah, it is beautifully done. Another chapter that I find interesting too, so once you go through all the chapters, working with all the different plants at the very end, it then goes on to summoning the old one for aid, which I think is interesting because I feel like that's something that you don't really come across in many texts at all is how to pretty much summon the devil and work with him. It's something that's so heavily shied away from. Yeah, I guess that is that um, it's a it's a real thread in the Three Hands Press books, you know, the, the rights of the devil um, and the black toad and things like that have quite a bit of um, devil magic in them. Um, but I think it's a great thing and it's a really interesting thing that she's linked um, some specific examples linked. She's written about some specific examples um, that you can use. Hmm. Yeah, and as she says in the back of it, while the plants assisting in the ritual work for calling the devil are interesting, the folk methods themselves offer cohesion and a rustic formula for drawing upon diabolical powers that resided not only within the plants but the land and the spirit of the devil and the hand of the practitioner, which I do like the fact that it's not just a this is some outside power that you're conjuring up, the fact that it's tied to everything because realistically if you want to look at things you know you can't just imagine that the world is perfect and white and lovely there is a shadow to everything so it makes sense to me at least that the devil would be in the practitioner in the landscape it would be everywhere as well you're just using that other side of it sort of going back to Gemma Gary's book of glitter and book of dew of how you know there is a white and dark in everyone yeah and I think that's it it's um I like the the different um, ways of conjuring the devil. The, there's a fun one from Denmark. If a man wishes to raise the devil for communication, he was to walk around a church three times, and on the third time he was to whistle into the keyhole of the church door or cry into it, come out. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty simple. Very simple. Although the French method was to go to a four-way crossroads at midnight with a black cock under the left arm and utter Robert nine times. <laughs> then the devil would appear, take the cock, leaving the person with a pile of money in exchange. <sighs> I think that get a um, different effect. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, I think um, you might get a, a different result in your house with that one. <laughs> well, no, no, I don't want to give anyone a... Um, a black cock really I mean you know (laughs) (laughs) there's a there is a rooster over the backyard that some days I some mornings I think I may want to um dedicate to the devil but you know um maybe that's your chance maybe that is my chance (laughs) no I'd never do that um she does talk about our plant henbane in this book um she does back henbane in particular seems as if it would have a deeper thread of law beyond being called the devil's eye it's being in the salancy as well as its historical ancient ritual and magico religious use its connection to the dead and medicinal use for topical pain relief and anesthetic applications would seem to qualify it as a plant in the league of the devil however the law does not tell this story the toxic plants hold to hold a stronger connection with him and may therefore have a more powerful sympathy to the spirit of wild adversary as interpreted from the praxis of the witch's dream. There is an intrinsic quality that these plants possess beyond their ability to act as mere poisons that associate them with greater offence of being favoured by the most powerful demonic force known to humankind. Quite yeah. eloquent. It is, and I think that's it. It's henbane might not be a devil's plant, but it's it certainly um, has its moments. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's something that I really admire about her work as a whole is the fact that she 
goes into the historical uses of a lot of these plants and how even though, you know, you do need to tread with caution, especially your dosage, but a lot of these were used originally as the very first anesthetics that we had. Mm. Yep. Henbane ointment is a great ton of, uh, topical anesthetic um, and anodyne pain reliever. So, yeah, that is um, that is true. Yeah, I know she, um, yeah, there's, yeah, on page 59. Yeah, she also includes a few amazing old recipes that she's put together. And one of them, from memory, it was used for a topical anesthetic. She's got written here, the most common plant ingredient included the slancia in the flying ointment proper is belladonna, Aconite and poison hemlock were also possible additions, both fatally toxic plants. Poplar, parsley, smallage or wild celery and cynical were extra ingredients of non-toxic nature. Other plants from the Salancia group in the witch's ointment included mandrake, thorn apple and henbane, all of which have common names linked with the devil. Yep. Yep. And that's a pretty standard um, list of herbs that we use in flying ointments even till today. Yeah. Um, I choose not to use hemlock um, in mine um, or aconite. Um, I do grow them, but I don't use them in any herbs that I sell, in the farms that I sell. And so speaking of henbane, this is one of those plants that I've tried to grow for years and I've always had this issue where I get it to seed, I get it to germinate, and it always stunts and dies. And this is my first successful year actually having it grown to a mature size plant but it's not one that I've actually had the chance to work with yet even though I've had this infatuation with it for absolute years and years so I was curious about the method you were speaking on earlier about how you use it yeah so I'll just touch on growing it um I've found henbane to be quite sensitive to damp um so if it's over watered or under watered but more overwatered, um, the young seedlings will wilt um, and and just die. They just don't recover, especially. And when I say young seedlings, I'm not talking sort of, you know, at dicot, you know, two leaf stage. I'm talking when it's at it's sort of I would call a juvenile seedling. It's it's probably about six to seven centimeters high. Um, it's got a couple of true leaves going on, and that's when they have a tendency to just fall over. Mm, um, that's that's there. about the stage I get to that I have not been able to get it past until this year. Yeah. And when they grow, they grow like the blazes, um, which is which is wonderful. Um, I use henbane in a couple of ways. So I love it in ointments. Um, I have it in two of the ointments I sell um, and I personally use it as a henbane only ointment, um, which I use both for pain, topical pain relief, but also um, for flight. It's a it's a very good flight herb. Um, it's it's recommended to be used in an ointment. Um, I prefer to use um, the leaves and the flowers if I'm going to make an ointment. Um, I know the seeds are traditionally used, but I do believe that the seeds are, are quite strong. So I've shied away from them a bit in the past. Um, henbane is, um, a noted psychoactive. It's, it's a tropane alco alkaloid, um, just like all of the other solanaceae. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a variety of different, um, henbanes, you know, there's, uh, yellow henbanes, white henbanes, um, black henbane and, yeah, there's quite a few different types. Like I think if you're a long-time follower of my Instagram, you've probably seen me say, what the hell is this henbane? Because it's nowhere near the same size as the other henbane I've got but was branded as the same from the people that I purchased it from, um, which was a bit frustrating. Yeah, I did wonder how that ended up resulting because, yeah, we had that discussion a while ago and you'd sent me photos where you'd had two of what was meant to be the same henbane but then they seemed just slightly different in their leaves and look yeah and and in the end completely different in size um and I think it was just simply a yellow henbane um 
that was branded as a black handmaiden. Right. Interesting. Cool. Um, so, yeah, and the yellow handmaiden, like it is It's probably a metre and a half tall, if not a bit more. Um, it's absolutely laden with seeds um, at the moment. Um, it's just incredible how many seeds there are on it. Um, it's had quite a few flowers. Um, I love the flowers. I think I like to pick the flowers after they've wilted, so usually after they've fertilised um, and they're starting to wilt on the plant and I just pluck them off and let them dry out. And it's really interesting, though, because um, there's a couple of things to note. They can give you contact dermatitis. All of henbane can, um, I've found. So... Um, either use gloves or just have a care to wash. Is that you or me? Sorry, um, that was me. Okay. <laughs> um, so wear gloves or just have a care to wash your hands quite quickly after you use it. Again, um, you know, I, I just had a bit of contact dermatitis this year where just wherever I'd touch the plant um, while plucking it and squeeze the juices under my skin, um, I just broke out in a bit of topical dermatitis. It's nothing drastic, but just something to be aware of. Um, but I love the flowers. I dry them, and then I like to use just one flower on a charcoal disc as an incense because it's the most amazing psychoactive smoke. It's just incredible. Now, is there a – you state specifically one flower? <laughs> well <laughs> – Look, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna breathe it in myself, um, I don't want to go more than one flower. Um, I'm not. It's not like I'm trying to fill a room with it and you know go full on, um, well, full on Oracle of Delphi, um, <laughs> which I'll read to you in a second. But um, yeah, now there is a lot of debate about which herbs the Oracles of Delphi um, used, um, and there's a great book on it by. Uh, if I remember, I'll put it in the show notes, but it's Sarah, someone, um, where she argues that it's Bay, and I think we said that in the Bay episode. But um, but in the um, Encyclopedia of Psychoactive Plants from Christian Rash, um, he has this great thing um, where he says the the following. The seeds, both alone and in combination with other substances, were usually burned as a ritual incense and inhaled, or the leaves were added to wine and drunk. When the soothsayers and prophetesses inhaled the smoke or drank the wine after their ritual ablutions, they called to the oracular deity, usually Apollo. When they had been possessed by the god, they would lose their human consciousness and proclaim the messages of Apollo through their mouths. Priests then translated i.e. interpreted and proclaimed as the roids of the oracle, they're often unintelligible, babbling, sighing and groaning. <laughs> now, that just means they might have taken a little bit too much, <laughs> um, in my opinion. Um, I do, I think one flower burnt is a good way to get into a divination state. Um, I don't, it's not, I'm not smoking it. I am, um, I'm not... I have it burning and I do waft is the correct word um, them into my the smoke into my um, lungs but I don't like just suck it down like you're sucking down um, a cigarette or a, some other kind of illegal substance <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah the smoke is amazing I, I do think you get a really good immediate um, effect from it. It's not a, it's not, doesn't something that creep up on you. You just sort of bang, okay, wow, <laughs> this is interesting. Um, and it's really great for divination. Mm. Now, it's such a, such a fascinating and such an old, old plant that's been used for so long. Yeah. And so much of the plant is interesting. Like the, um, it was Harold. Roth, who um, called the seed pods little cauldrons. And I, honestly, I hadn't seen it that way before. And as soon as he said it, I was like, how could I not have seen this before? Because <laughs> um, that's exactly what they look like. Um, 
and to these ones on my henbane right now are big cauldrons. Um, they're really chunky and and just really full of seed, really big seed too, um, for for a henbane which doesn't have very big seeds. Um, but yeah, it's a it's such an interesting herb. Um, you know, it's it's the divine madness of the prophetic, um, and it's that way that um, it's so taboo, um, especially because, you know, if you don't really know the difference between foxglove and henbane, like they're obviously not the same plant, but you could see how people can mistake it for the other one. Um, so, yeah, that's always a good, it's always good to know what you're taking. Hmm. So. And even then, as you mentioned before, of how you wound up with two of the same plant but different subspecies in a sense, oh, yeah. would you find or would you state you found any difference between the typical black that we tend to work with compared to the yellow? Um, no, um, although the yellow is supposed to be less strong, um, but then I haven't found these ones to be less strong at all. So, hmm. Yeah, it, um, I feel like in that funnily enough seems to share a sort of similar coincidence with foxglove too because, you know, as they state, it's Digitalis purpurea, the purple foxglove that you should be working with for these poisonous aspects. But you sort of question like, you know, does it really is how much difference does it truly make? Yeah, and I think I think with most herbs the difference is um, in that if they've been bred for colours or like for different colours and things, often um, other aspects of the herb uh, are bred out. Um, you know, like there's a lot of um, a lot of poppies out there that supposedly don't have um, opioids in them um, because it's been bred out because they were for ornamental purposes and things like that. And um, and I think that's the case when you look at there's some yarrows um, that just don't seem as potent um, mm. with different colours. Like there's there's a bunch of yarrows on the market now that are orange and, um, you know, they're like orange with a hint of red at the centre and, and they're beautiful. Um, but I found when I've grown them they're not as vigorous um, and they're not as – they're not as juicy, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> one way of putting it <laughs> yeah. well, like, literally juicy you know like a straight um purple yarrow you know you pluck the twig and you can squeeze the the center rib and it it's juicy and these um these orange ones are they just don't give off the same fluids <laughs> weirdly interesting yeah yeah there's um there's a account of henbane seed use in Dale Pendel's um, pharmacognosis um, and he says it's uh, from Gustav Schenk. He says, Schenk placed a handful of henbane seeds on an iron plate. Now a handful, what's a handful of henbane seeds? If you're talking <laughs> like a handful, that's a shit ton. That is um, a lot, yeah. <laughs> if, if he's talking like a handful, like, five which is my brain is what I have that's a handful um well that's very different he says he puts it on an iron plate and heated the plant with an alcohol lamp and inhaled the smoke from the smoldering seeds he says the ears become deaf the eyes almost blind they see in a haze only the bulk of objects whose contours are blurred the sufferer is slowly cut off from the outside world and sinks irretrievably into himself and his own inner world now, Schenk describes how while he was staring at the charred seeds, he couldn't figure out what had happened to him um, and it was like Henbane had erased her footprints. Prince. Um, now, obviously, dude took too much, <laughs> seriously, but um, I do totally get the whole the ears become deaf. It Henbane is a real, a real barrier creator. Like it, it really, um, it really takes the the mundane world and goes. Nah, I'm gonna put like a, I want to say a astronaut's helmet over your head, <laughs> and I feel like the 
pressure in your ears increases and, um, yeah, just all the pressure in your skull sort of increases. Um, and that's sort of, that's sort of the experience of handmade smoke for me. <laughs> that's interesting because I know it makes sense though that it would have that sort of effect because the Greeks and the Romans often used it for its sedative properties. So yeah, it makes perfect sense, which I think is something else which is worth sort of noting with it is it was originally used medicinally. It was really prized for those properties. It's been long prized for its medicinal properties and seen by the medical community as a very important source of new drugs. This is the odd nature of henbane in low doses that can be beneficial. Ancient Greeks and Romans prized henbane for its soporiferic sedative and analgesic qualities. The Roman Diosorides listed henbane for pain relief in his famous herbal Dematuria medicia. Audacious doctors at the time discovered the anesthetic properties of henbane were greatly increased by mixing the plant with opium, of course. <laughs> no shit. Yeah, no shit. Smearing with ground paste of opium and henbane to relieve ear inflammation. Of course that's going to fucking work. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, it's one of those plants that it's so strange that it was so highly prized back in the day and used and then something has changed Modern medicine, of course, has come about, but now it's seen as one of those devil plants of everything. Yeah, that, that are just completely taboo. You know, it, it was used as a beer traditionally. Like henbane was made into a beer, like, you know, 40 grams of leaf to 23 litres of water. Um, you know, and they're saying that um, henbane beer creates its own thirst um, and once you start, everything around you will be drunk. And that's, of course, a simple tropane, um, scopalamine side effect, right? Um, any of the solanaceae um, create a dryness in the constitution and, and thirst. Um, so, you know, if you have heaps of henbane beer around, you're just going to keep drinking it. You may <laughs> overdose. Um, so... Um, yeah, it, it's not um, at that dosage, it's not very strong, you know. So, um, and it's another one of those things where um, it has the beer is supposed to have a reddish cast. And if you drink too much, it will have everything looking a bit reddish for a few days afterwards, um, which is an interesting side effect of a plant called Hemia as well. You um, you drink too much of it, it's quite yellow, um, it makes things look yellow for a few days afterwards. I was actually going to mention that. I'd, it's the only plant I'd come across that it seemed to have that effect. So I was, it's interesting to hear that henbane has a similar property. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a weird one. And you sort of think, how does that actually work? What's going on? Yeah. Um, so that's something to research and um, and look into from there. Hmm. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about doing with Henbane is, you know, those fancy cocktail bars um, that you go to these days, you know, not that I get to go to a fancy cocktail bars very often, but they'll often smoke the glass. So they'll, they'll light, you know, either like a cherry wood or something and they'll put the glass that you're about to have your drink of over it and the smoke fills up the glass itself and then they tip it back up and then pour the alcohol, the cocktail into it. I would love to do that with handmade. <laughs> like, well, this would make for an interesting video now, wouldn't it? It will make for an interesting video. <laughs> but, um, it's just what what cocktail do I put in it? You know, do I? Um, maybe beer, I'll of course, surely. Well, sh surely, but who who has weeks and weeks to make handmade beer? I mean, seriously. <laughs> um, I also don't have enough herbage because the uh, caterpillars um, got really high off my henbane. So um, I have a lot of food, <laughs> um, but not. I did collect like a good jar of herb, but probably not. Um, probably not enough to spare for the for the beer this year. Maybe so next year. What parts of the plant do you generally like using, or are you generally taking all of the separate parts themselves, or are you mostly working with the flowers, as you mentioned before? Um. Mostly in my balms, I use the leaves, um, as I said, and um, the flowers I use for incenses. Um, I will be trying – I use the seeds in balms for myself 
Um, and are you but, cult- are you cultivating from seed now out of out of curiosity? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was I like to supplement. Um, so if I see them come up um, for sale, I'll often buy some. Mainly because I like genetic diversity in my plants. Um, I think that when you start growing, there's arguments to keep everything one strain and your own, but there's also arguments to bring in other strains um, of plants from elsewhere to keep that, to get diversity happening and and interesting things going on in the garden. Um, Like I have two types of calendula. I have one that is quite a small flowered calendula that the the plants were allegedly grown from seed from um, bark, you know, the bark flower dude's garden um, that were collected in France and brought to Australia. So, you know, I think they're interesting, but they're really small flowered calendula as opposed to the ones, the other ones I have, which are much bigger. Um, also dandelion, I think dandelion and, and plantain have so many varieties um, I like to try and have the different ones around. You know, there's some really short stemmed dandelion flowers. Um, there's some very long stemmed ones. There's, you know, very small broadleaf plantains. There's very large broadleaf plantains. There's purple plantains. Yeah, so I, I try to buy things as well as um, grow them from seed. Hmm. And is there any sort of tips that you would give to people like myself going through the years of hard work of trying to get them to actually propagate properly? From growing from seed, any sort of tips on soil soil types or anything of the such? Patience. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I sow the seed as soon as it's um, ripe off the plant. So as soon as those um, little cauldrons turn brown, I like to um, sow a bunch of the seed um, straight away and then usually I'll just put those seed flats aside and they've like last year's seed flats were they got moldy they got um through winter like with no seedlings coming up um they took a good 12 weeks to come up from seed um yeah it was a it's just patience it's Mm. waiting for them to be ready yeah I know mine's just finished it's first flowering and has just got seed pods for me on it at the moment. So I'll be interested to see how it goes again next year. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the seed pods are really firmly attached to the plant. So don't try to pick them off with just your fingers. You'll need, if you're going to try to pick them off while the plant's still growing out the further along the branch, then you'll need a knife. Um, but I don't recommend doing that. If, you, if you're worried that you're going to lose the seed, um, out of them, just wrap that um, wrap a brown paper bag around that part of the branch loosely, and the seeds will fall into the the brown paper bag. Awesome. Sweet. Um, what else about hembane? Um, it was the bane of the hog. I like that. It's the same. Basically, um, pigs really like the plant, um, but they get uh, stomach cramps. <laughs> Which. I know, yeah, it's a funny one with the names of that because then I've heard the same for, well, the fact that it's hen bane because there's also dog bane too and they've stated that it's poisonous to dogs and it's sort of a strange naming mechanism that they used to have back in the day. Yeah, but, you know, I haven't, I thought dog bane, and I may have to do some research on this, but I thought that dog bane um, was more that they didn't like the smell and it would keep them away from your garden. But I have to check that. No one take that as gospel. I do. No, I did come across that recently as well of supposedly it's meant to keep dogs away and I was thinking about testing it out with my dogs to see whether they're opposed to it or not. Mm. Should Personally, I? if I want to keep a plant uh, animals away from some plants, I spray them with chilli um, tea. So... <laughs> Generally, I find that works, but we have one dog in particular that we, when she was a pup, she was just, as puppies do, into everything. So we had tried everything and so gotten the hottest chili I could, powdered it, put it into an area where she kept eating things and then came out one day and she's just sitting there chewing away on the chili like some dogs (laughs) just don't care. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, yeah, normally it works, but certain dogs like my own does not give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. Have you tried raw onion? Yeah, she'll go for it. If it if I, even though <laughs> onion is toxic to dogs, please don't feed onions. I didn't know that. Yeah, it'll cause them long. It'll cause, cause renal fa- failure long term. So they they can have minute mutes amounts, but generally, please don't feed anything with onion to your dogs. But anything that falls on the ground in the kitchen at all, there's nothing that deters her. She'll sit there and chew on rocks sometimes. Like, <laughs> <sighs> I give up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I might, um, um, for, before next episode, take her out the front and let her sniff the dog bane and see if there's any kind of response. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe see what, um, double check the uh, chemicals in it and then do that. Um, <laughs> Gee, I hope that lapel mic's not picking up my tummy grumbles there. Um, but um, it's – there's a – in the – what am I looking at here? Um, Susan Lavender and Anna Franklin's Herbcraft book. Um, they have a traditional spell for raising the spirits that involves the practitioner making an incense of henbane, fennel root, frankincense, coriander and cassia and going to a dark, haunted and enchanted forest. The incense should be burned in the censer on a stump surrounded by black candles. The candles will suddenly be extinguished by the spirits that have formed there. To banish the spirits, burn an incense of asphatida and frankincense. That's like... Well, you're already going to a haunted and enchanted forest. I mean, really, <laughs> it isn't going to take too much um, to get them to come. So, yeah, I, look, and henbane's used for love as well in a lot of things, and I still haven't quite worked that out. Maybe it's just the whole, um, maybe it's just the whole sort of fecund, you know, pregnant-looking seed pods and things like that. Mm, it's an odd one, but I found that with a few plants over the years, where it seems like. Ones you wouldn't pick, it's suddenly like, oh, use this for love magic. And you're like, really? Something that can be so toxic? I know there's claims and I don't, like, I feel like, you know, how much can you really back up these claims? But supposedly Cleopatra used henbane to commit suicide. Hmm. I didn't know that one. Hmm, something I stumbled across. But, I mean, then again, how do we really test this theory out in this day and age? That's right. Not like we can dig her up. <laughs> um, look, if you guys are interested in reading more about henbane, I think you sh- you have to, if you're interested in psychoactive plants at all, you need to own um, Christian Ratch, R-A-T-C-H, this, um, the Encyclopedia of Psychoactive Plants. Um, the... You also should always own Dale Pendle's three book series um, on pharmaco- the Pharmaco series. Um, we now recommend Plants of the Devil as an interesting little book. Um, but it's mainly do your research, start small, start external. You know, don't um, don't go internal first. No. <laughs> And I think that's yeah. sort of a good thing as well of flying ointments for one is a lot of those toxins don't really make it past that skin barrier. So it's sort of, you know, and a little bit of a plug to your business. It's a good way to sort of start and dabble. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Um, I think also the thing about people, well, the thing about my balms is I test them Um you know, I test them in really large quantities. Like, you know, I, I honestly I'll put a whole teaspoon on myself um, before I recommend it to anyone else. And my recommended dosage for most people is like a pea-sized um, amount. Um, and I want to know at, at what point is is too much and then I don't want to give you that much, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um <laughs> You know, and and I do that on each um, each batch because you know different seasons. You know, some seasons when we have lots of rain, um, things will be less often less toxic. Um, when we have very little rain, they they're often stronger. Um, you know, there's a whole theory with um, herbal medicine that you you sort of starve the plant. Um, of 
of water so that you can harvest them. So stress you know, creates that, alkaloids. Yep. That's right. Stress creates alkaloids. <laughs> um, you know, that's it. Is if you want to start, start with things from a reputable practitioner. Um, you know, and if you want to start with internals, then I would honestly recommend tinctures. Um, you know, one of my most popular products and um, products that a few uh, well-respected magical practitioners buy from me is um, the mugwort tincture. Um, it's a fantastic nighttime dreaming herb. Um, if you don't want to have something strong or you don't want to um, – you know, you're worried about stepping into the more toxic herbs. Mugwort works really well, and so does Skullcap. Um, you know, these plants, there are alternatives to the Banefuls. Um, you just have to know what you're getting. Yeah, and as, as you said, you need to know what you're getting. Please, if you're not sure, don't go buy IDing stuff in the wild. <laughs> I've always been amazed at the amount of people I've met over the years that have insisted that something that they've found is what they think it is when it's not even close. Like it's so <laughs> easy to misidentify things. So unless you're certain, like you said, buy from a reputable source because there's yeah. so many weirdos on eBay that are like, oh, I'm selling this plant, this is totally what it is, when it's completely not. And not even weirdos, people who who know what they're talking about but have been given the wrong information. You know, I've been I've been called out before where I've gone, this is this, and then I've realised, no, it's not. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I have a friend who's a distiller um, and she does the most wonderful distilling of gin botanicals and things, and um, I pulled her up because she, she had something she was calling a lemon... Um, myrtle and it just completely wasn't like and she had the like and this is what we talk about use the botanical names when you can um, use double check your references check photos check more than just google photos go to pages where people have written about the plant and have photos of it and have um, backup you know, botanical references and things like that. Um, look for things that identify the plant, you know. Does it have this type of leaf? Does it have fur on it? Well, you know, little furry things on it. Um, is it slick? It, does it have a silver on one side and it's green on the other side? Does it, um, you know, learn about what dentate leaves look like um, as opposed to oblate, you know. Um, so you can tell the difference between dandelion and not dandelion. Um, you know, take the time to get to know your plants. Um, yeah, don't don't just pick stuff in nature, especially mushrooms. I think we talked about this pretty, <laughs> yep. pretty deeply in our mushroom episode. <laughs> yeah, please do your research, people. And, um, yeah, there's so many, that's the thing I think that we're really lucky about is there's so many amazing reputable sellers as well online that we do have access to in australia especially for these sorts of plants go there first yeah yeah absolutely um so we started this episode pretty much straight into the book and the and the plant um what else has been going on with you uh everything and nothing <laughs> <laughs> we are we have just decided to look for a new house to live in Mm -hmm. So I have found that my miniature farm that I'm cultivating in the middle of the city is not big enough, so we're looking for acreage, which is quite quite fun and daunting at the same time. So we've been doing a whole lot of that and then trying to, of course, juggle everything else in my life. But how about you? Yeah, well, I've been um, – I've taken the rather exciting step of trying to turn Belladonna and Bones into a full-time um, business, um, which means there's a lot of new things coming, um, some really exciting ceremonial ceramics. Um, so I'm working on – I'll have a limited release of some scrying bowls that I'm making out of black porcelain, um, you know, which I hope people will just love. They're going to be um, – they're going to be black – gloss porcelain so when you place your um your scrying waters into them um 
you'll get that beautiful mirrored effect. Um, then I've also got um, some saint um, work sets coming. I've got a saint expedite um, set that will be launched in April. Um, we'll have a statue that I'm working on of saint expedite as well as um, herbs and um, prayer cards. So there's a few things to do there. Um, what else? I'm doing a webinar series on um, different plants. So basically um, expanding on the information that I had in my Magica Herbe um, box, subscription box release, and going a bit deeper and doing videos on um, the, the, the magic and the medicine of those plants, um, as well as I'm doing a potions course. I'm going to be teaching a potions course, which I'm really excited about. <laughs> very excited I've always been wondering how long until you're about to do this venture in the back of my head I'm like surely one day this will be her full-time gig <laughs> well look we'll see how we go um I think with anything it's hard to hard to go from a part-time job to a full-time job but um you know I've got the opportunity now and I'm financially secure and can afford to to take this moment and give it a go so there's been a few um new purchases uh, in terms of microphones and getting cameras set up and to record video and things like that. And then there's also the uh, terrifying um, aspect of putting yourself in front of a video camera, which um, <laughs> is awesome. <laughs> so, um, uh, and I've been really doing yeah, look, we'll see how we go. But um, I'm interested in hearing from our listeners. If you want to um, chip in and tell me um, what you'd like to learn, um, you know, from, well, I feel like the potions course is pretty bed down, but um, what other things you'd like to hear about magical herbs and things, um, that'd be great. So I'd love to hear from you. Just drop me a line on Instagram at Bella Donna and Bones. Um, or you can drop me a line on um, Gmail at Belladonna and Bones. You can join our mailing list um, by visiting the Garden of Ink and Bones. There's all sorts of ways to contact us, <laughs> and I'm really excited about that. What about um, how can people get in touch with you, Rue? The same old. You can find me on Instagram at old underscore omen. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you guys to do something I don't normally ask you to do, and that is um, – if you've got a chance, leave us a review and recommend our podcast to all your friends if you like it. We, you know, we don't often do much promotion like that, um, but we would like to. Um, we'd love to have your reviews up on iTunes and whatever your podcast preferred um, things are. Um, all right, peeps, thank you very much. We will see you there next month with a new episode you may see a video from me pop up in your podcast feed i'm gonna port any videos i put up onto youtube into our podcast feed as well for now and see what you guys think so let us know what you think of that as well awesome until next time you guys see you guys <laughs>